Okay, great. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for attending the 2021 UA World Innovation Summit Spring Conference. I am the host today, Peng Zhu Yu, from the Department of Brand Cognitive Sciences at MIT. Today, it's a great pleasure to have invited Professor Todd Golub as our value guest speaker. Professor Todd Golub is the director of Broad Institute at MIT and Harvard, the founding core member and the director of Gustavner Center for Cancer Diagnostics at the Broad Institute. He's also a member of faculty at the Dana Farber Cancer Institute and Harvard Medical School. Professor Golub is the world leader in understanding the basis of cancer by creating and applying genetic tools. He has made fundamental discoveries in the molecular basis of childhood leukemia and laid foundations for the diagnosis and classification of human cancer using genomics. He also pioneered the development of new cell-based approach to drug discovery for cancer and for other diseases. He is a recipient of multiple awards, including the Erasmus Hematology Award, the Richard Hinder Rosenthal Memorial Award, the Outstanding Achievement Award from the American Association for Cancer Research, and the Amy Johnson Award from Society for, for, Pediatric, for Pediatric Research, and so on. In 2014, he was elected to the National Academy of Medicine. During the speech, if you have any questions, please feel free to type them in the Q&A box below. At the end of the speech, we're going to have a Q&A session. So now without further ado, please join to me to welcome Professor Todd Gallup for his talk. Thank you so much. It's great to be here and great to be part of this uh, exciting summit. Uh, let me share my screen. Perfect. Second. Okay, um, great. It's great to be here. I have a couple of disclosures for a couple of companies that I'm involved in, but I won't be discussing their products during, during this talk today. So it, it seems important to recognize it, that this year in, in 2021 is the 20th anniversary of the sequencing of the human genome, the first draft of the human genome, which was reported in February of 2021. Uh, that first genome is estimated to have cost maybe $3 billion to sequence all 3 billion letters of the human genome. On the one hand, that's only $1 per base in the human genome. On the other hand, that's a lot of money for a single genome. And so it's really amazing. It's astounding that today the cost of sequencing the entirety of the human genome is about $600. And at the Broad Institute, where I work, uh, the group there is sequencing human genomes at a rate of about one every three minutes. And it's looking like costs will continue to drop, uh, perhaps as low as $100 or less in the few years ahead. So this is going to fundamentally change, I think, uh, how we think about the human genome and its place in medicine, research, and the daily practice of medicine. When I was a college student, it wasn't even a discussion about sequencing the human genome as too expensive to do. It was just not on anyone's radar as even something that you could, would even be conceivable. And so now it seems pretty clear that as we approach $100 per genome, that sequencing the human genome will become part of everyone's routine medical care. It will be part of their medical record. There's a lot of work to be done to get there, but that's clearly the future um, that is coming. So it might be reasonable to assume that 20 years after the sequencing of the human genome, we basically know what's inside the genome. Uh, and so I'm gonna share a, a little, just a little side story about a, a postdoc in, in my lab called John Prenzner, um, also a pediatrician who said, well, maybe we don't know all that's in the human genome. Maybe there are actually protein coding genes that are hidden in the genome, not among the, what are believed to be only about 20,000 protein coding genes in the human genome. Maybe there are additional protein coding sequences in the human genome to be discovered. Maybe they're between genes. Maybe they're right at the beginning. Recording of in progress. Or maybe they're 
stuck in the middle of genes and are in our and uh, of known genes and are otherwise too difficult to identify. And so I won't go through the, the details here because they don't really matter, but John went through a computational approach to identify what looks like it may be thousands of non-canonical, non-traditional hidden proteins within the human genome. And then asked, could you call, test about 500 of those, he chose 553, in experiments in the lab to say, well, are these just computational predictions but they're not real proteins? Or is there experimental evidence that they actually do exist? And the answer there was very clear, that these proteins really do exist. Um, and he used a number of different methods to prove that. I won't go into them in any detail because it doesn't matter here. And moreover, he showed that about 10% of those hidden proteins are even required for the survival of cancer cells, meaning that these could represent previously unrecognized drug targets against cancer. So why do I mention this? Not because the details of this are, are so important, although I think it is important that there may be thousands of more protein coding genes in the human genome than we actually thought ever existed, but more just that the human genome is so mysterious and even though it's been sequenced and is now, you know, the Broad will sequence 200,000 human genomes from 200,000 individuals in this year alone, there's an enormous amount to be learned. And so this is just, I think, really an exciting time uh, to be in biological research, in genome research. Uh, and it's going to have particular importance for the study of disease, in particular cancer. And that's what I'm going to focus most of my time on today. And that is the idea of cancer precision medicine. So you may know that traditionally the way patients with cancer have been treated is that more or less they get the same treatment, which is chemotherapy, which is pretty much just poisons that slightly kill tumor cells slightly more often than they kill normal cells. Uh, so it's not so surprising that chemotherapy as a form of poison is not particularly effective at eradicating all the tumor cells in the body while minimizing side effects because side effects are common because the chemo also kills normal cells. And so the idea of cancer precision medicine is that maybe we could use the genome of the tumor that is finding all of the mutations that have arisen in the tumor cells, but not in the normal cells in the body and use those that mutational profile as a guide to selecting targeted therapies, specific therapies for that particular molecular type of cancer, and hope that that would result not just in an initial response, but in a long-term response, if not cure for patients. This is easier said than done. The initial problem was that, well, it was how could you imagine doing routine, routine tumor genome sequencing in cancer clinics? But actually that's been solved now. That's quite routine. Most cancer centers and a number of companies are doing this routinely and cost-effectively. The challenge is how do you interpret the meaning of the tumor genome so as to inform which targeted therapies the patient should receive? So I'm gonna say a little bit about how we're thinking about this because I believe deeply that cancer precision medicine will be the way of the future, and we're starting to see it happen, but there's a lot of work to be done to make it the case that all patients in the future are treated in this way. So how can we think about making these kinds of therapeutic predictions based on the tumor genome? Well, you could think about this in two fundamental ways learning from patients in the patient experience and how they respond to treatment in the clinic and learning from experimental models of cancer in the laboratory. So you could say, well, wouldn't it be better always to learn from patients because you know they're real human beings and it's the most physiologically relevant thing and you're trying to cure patients, you're not trying to cure test tubes. Why not focus all your energy on, on learning from patients? And the challenge there is that the experiment you'd really like to do 
would be to take many thousands of patients with cancer and treat them with all possible cancer drugs and see which ones worked and which ones didn't. And then if you had that data set, then you could find the associations between the molecular aspects of the tumor and which dr drug each patient responded to. But of course you can't do that. That would be completely unethical and not feasible. Most patients are treated with only one or a few drugs. And so while it's attractive to try to make these kinds of learnings for patients, and we should continue to do that, and I'll say more about this, it's probably not sufficient because we need to do the systematic drug treatments, for example, in the laboratory setting where you can take a cancer cell line, for example, growing in a Petri dish in a lab and subject it to treatment with all known drugs, for example, and ask which ones kill the tumor cells and which one didn't. And from that comprehensive data set, learn the rules of what are the molecular aspects of the tumor that predict response or non-response to any given drug. So my belief is that rather than having to choose between these two ideas, learning from patients and learning from the laboratory, we need to do both because they're both imperfect. Uh, but by intersecting the two is where we stand uh, to learn the most. And so I'll say a little bit about, about both. First about learning from patients. In the US, one of the challenges is that the vast majority of patients with cancer are not treated on a clinical trial. And so, and even the majority of patients aren't treated at major research hospitals, cancer centers, for example, they're treated in community practices. And so in that kind of community setting, we're not learning from those patients in their patient experience. And so there's an enormous amount of patient experience that could inform research, but it is not because those patients are not plugged in to research centers and researchers interested in learning from the data. Is it because patients aren't interested in participating in research? No, to the contrary, they're really frustrated that even if you know they're not going to make it through their treatment for their cancer, they would like to participate to making cancer treatment better in the future for patients. And so we need better ways to be able to make sure that we can learn from all patients' experience. And so the work of a team at the Broad started thinking about, is there a way that we could capture this information, the clinical information and the genomic information from patients anywhere using social media, of course, using informed consent because it's critical to make sure that we have appropriate permission from patients to collect and store and analyze their data. Even if it's maintained securely, you need informed consent in order to analyze those data. Um, but could we do this not by patients having to go to a major research university to enter into a study, but just for patients to be able to raise their hand and say, count me in, I want to participate in, in cancer research. And so we started uh, a project, an initiative called Count Me In, led by Nick Wagley at the Broad and the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, whose goal it is to make it possible for any patient anywhere to contribute their clinical and genomic information for research. This is starting in the US and Canada, uh, but we're exploring uh, how to extend this kind of concept uh, beyond North America to the rest of the world. The flagship initial project uh, to test whether this was a good idea at all, because maybe it would turn out that even if you made it possible for patients to sign up to contribute their information for research, maybe they wouldn't do it. So to test this idea, a project in metastatic breast cancer, that is breast cancer that's spread throughout the body, which is why most patients die of breast cancers because of this metastatic spread, it's still relatively understudied from a molecular and genomic perspective. And so the metastatic breast cancer project was started under the Count Me In initiative, allowing 
metastatic breast cancer patients to sign up through social media channels um, for the company and project. So did anyone sign up? The answer was pretty spectacular. In a very short amount of time, the company and project, I was able to sign up patients from all 50 states in the United States, not just coming from you know, the Harvard Cancer Center and uh, other major cancer cent research centers in the US, but from across the country, including rural areas. And to really illustrate this, as you see on this slide, if you look at all of the patients that have enrolled in this metastatic breast cancer study, yeah, there were some major cancer centers like MD Anderson Cancer Center and the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center that contributed you know, 40, 50, 60 patients. But look at this, there are over a thousand institutions, clinical practices, small hospitals throughout the country that were contributing just a single patient to this company and effort. And the conventional wisdom is, oh, you know, you can't do research like that. You have to do research based on just a major cohort of patients all coming from the same hospital. And this is showing, no, we can collect patients from around the country and everyone can have the opportunity to participate if we make it easy for them to raise their hand and say, count me in, and we make it easy to collect that information. So I'm excited about this new patient-centered mechanism for engagement in, in clinical research, uh, how this will extend to other cancers beyond breast cancer and also to non-cancer diseases, particularly for rare diseases where any individual hospital may not see enough patients to be able to really study it in great detail. But if you could aggregate data from across a country or across the world, then even rare diseases become feasible. And that's really exciting. So I've focused so far on, on thinking about how we best use drugs that already exist, that are part of cancer care and trying to deploy the best treatments for patients with cancer. But we don't have at all anything close to having all the drugs we need for cancer. Where's this next generation of cancer drugs gonna come from? And of course, there are many companies taking various approaches, but let me unpack this a little bit to say something about the approaches that we're taking um, at the Broad. And this is of course gonna focus on how we learn from the laboratory. There are two basic strategies for discovering drugs, in this case, cancer drugs, target-based and cell-based. Target-based drug discovery says, I know the protein, for example, that I want to inhibit because I know that a particular protein is important for the survival of a cancer cell. And so I wanna know that I wanna make a drug to inhibit that protein because if I effectively inhibit that protein, I'm confident that the cell will die. That's an attractive strategy, but you need to start by knowing what the protein is that you wanna go after in the first place. And in some cases we don't know. And also oftentimes researchers can very effectively find a drug that will bind that protein in a test tube in the laboratory. But then when they take that same drug and try to treat living cells, or living organisms like a mouse or a human with a drug, it doesn't work at all. And so there's a disconnect between what's happening biochemically at the protein level and what's happening at the cellular or organismal level. So that's a shortcoming of the target-based approach. The alternative approach is something called cell-based screening, where what if you could screen chemical compounds or drugs against living cells and ask, for example, which of those drugs killed a tumor cell, a living tumor cell, without having to know in advance what was the target, the direct protein target of that Fletcher, drug. to have invited Professor. That's really attractive. But the problem there is that researchers typically take a cancer cell line derived from a single patient and screen the drugs against that, and then find that often you can find a drug that will kill that particular specific type of cancer. But then when you try to generalize that drug treatment, 
beyond that particular type of cancer to other molecular types of cancer in other patients, it fails to extend beyond that particular model. So what if we could extend the cell-based approach, not just to test one cancer model, one cancer cell line at a time, but what if we could do hundreds at a time? Because we know that there are hundreds of molecular subtypes of cancer, and we need to embrace that molecular diversity of cancer because cancer is not a single disease. It's hundreds of molecularly distinct diseases. What if we could build that knowledge of the molecular diversity of cancer into our screening from the beginning? And that was the work of Channing Yu, a postdoc in the lab, who said, what if I could insert into cancer cell lines a molecular barcode, a short stretch of DNA that serves like a barcode to register each cancer cell line. So now if I, I have many hundreds of cancer cell lines, each barcoded, so I know which is which, that allows me to pool all those different cancer cell lines together, say 500 of them all together, but each of them is barcoded. So if I have a molecular barcode reader and the details don't matter how you do that, but there are genomic ways to read these molecular barcodes. Now I could, in a single well of a dish, a single Petri dish, I could be treating not one cancer cell line with a drug and see what happens, but 500 at a time. Molecularly distinct cancers treat with a drug and see which of them survive. That's not good. Which of them are killed? And then learn the rules of, okay, what was it about those cancers that were killed by the drug versus those that weren't? And then if I could turn that into a diagnostic test, that would identify the patient population in the future that might be treated with that drug. So that was the idea we call the method PRISM, this molecular barcoding method. This was coupled with a library of drugs that exist, not just for cancer, but for any kind of disease, we collected more than 6,000 of these drugs um, across all phases of clinical development and being FDA approved and approved by other non-US regulatory agencies. Again, across not just cancer, but drugs in development for diabetes and immune disorders and all kinds of things. And we said, is it possible that some of these drugs that have been developed in particular not for cancer, but for other diseases, is it possible that some of them might actually have anti-cancer activity and we just didn't know it? And could we discover that by, again, not just treating a single cancer cell line with those drugs, but hundreds of them, in this case, 578 of them. And so the experiment that Stephen Corsello, a postdoc in the lab, uh, did, was the following kind of crazy experiment, which is that he took about 4,500 drugs, again, again, developed against different diseases, and he treated 578 cancer cell lines with each of those 4,500 drugs. This, I think, scale of this kind of experiment gives you a sense of what the future of biomedical research looks like. Um, which is that it's becoming increasingly possible to do things at a scale that we never previously thought was, was possible. And then to ask the question, do any of those drugs, particularly those developed for things other than cancer, do they actually kill a subset of cancer cells? Um, and the answer was yes. As shown on the right, you can see that Chemotherapy drugs killed some of the cancer cell lines. That wasn't surprising because they're chemo. We expect them to. In fact, they kill most cells, which reflects their um, lack of specificity for particular types of cancer. We also saw, as shown in orange, that the targeted cancer drugs that have been developed against particular tumor types those also showed 
that they killed some cancer cell lines across this panel of 578 cell lines and not others. And that was good. That showed that we were able to rediscover those drugs. But what was most surprising is this large number of non-cancer drugs that also showed this pattern of killing some cancer cell lines, but not others. And that's the hallmark of a selective, specific anti-cancer drug. Something that kills nothing, none of the cell lines, obviously, that's not interesting because that's not going to be a great cancer drug. You might think, well, something a drug that kills all cancer cell lines, wouldn't that be the best? Because then you could cure all cancer? Well, maybe, except the problem there is that Drugs that kill all cancer cell lines are most likely to have bad side effects because they're likely to kill normal cells as well. So what's most interesting are those drugs that kill a small subset of cancer cell lines and spare the rest. Okay. So how do you look at this? So we have this large data set now of 4,500 drugs by 578 cell lines. So each drug treatment really is like a vector in 578 dimensions. And I don't know about you, but I'm not very good at visualizing 578 dimensions. I have enough trouble visualizing three dimensions. So there need to be new computational approaches developed to collapse this very high dimensional space, 578 dimensional space, down into for example, two dimensions, as shown here. This uses a method called UMAP. There are other methods called like principal component analysis you might have heard about. Um, but what's really cool here is that now each of, each of the dots that you're seeing here is a drug. And we're seeing that these drugs are clustering together, not based on their chemical structure or based on what we previously knew about them, but simply based on their similarity of which cancer cell lines they kill or they don't kill. And what you do sort of in one experiment is redis rediscover classes of known anti-cancer drugs, um, which is pretty remarkable. So um, this is a, it's kind of a new kind of annotation of drugs that we didn't used to be able to have before. Now I'm going to show one example of an early result that we're still working on here. Um, and uh, let me walk you through this through this slide. So there's a very famous protein called MDR1, it stands for multi-drug resistance gene one. And people have been studying this because it's been known for decades that tumors often turn on this MDR1 gene as a way to pump chemotherapy drugs out of the cell and therefore make them resistant. And so that's why you often hear of patients with cancer initially being treated with chemotherapy that works for a while, but then this MDR1 pump turns on and it pumps the chemo drugs out of the cancer cells and the cancer cells survive and that's bad. So we looked at this large data set that we created with respect to MDR1. And what you're looking at here, each column is one of each of the 578 human cancer cell lines in the study. And at the top in red, you see that there's a great diversity of those cell lines. Some express high levels of MDR1, as shown in the left in red, and then some express very low levels, amounts of this MDR1 protein. Okay. Now, how does that relate to drug sensitivity? We look at it at the bottom in blue, Again, each of the columns is a different cell line. And we see that those same cell lines that express high levels of the drug resistance gene, MDR1, are resistant to these chemotherapy drugs. And those that have low levels of expression remain sensitive. So that shows us that we're able to rediscover what was known about this drug resistance mechanism, which makes you feel good about the system. But the most interesting thing was this, which was that there was a single drug that showed the opposite. 
a drug called tapoxylin, which I'd never heard of. It was in the collection um, uh, in the drug library. It had the opposite effect. It killed only those cancers that expressed high levels of this MDR1 drug resistance protein. And it didn't kill unless MDR1 was expressed. And that would be really interesting because we need drugs that will kill these drug resistant tumors. What is tapoxylin? So it turns out that tapoxylin was developed uh, initially as a treatment for dogs for arthritis. Um, the chemical structure is shown here. It had some initial clinical development in humans also for pain relief and arthritis, but then was abandoned. We're working out the exact molecular mechanism of how this drug works now. We still don't know exactly, but we do know that it doesn't work by the mechanism for which the drug was developed in the first place, which is to be an inhibitor of these two enzymes, one called cyclooxygenase and one called 5-lipoxygenase. Details don't matter. But we did a bunch of experiments and were able to show that this drug, tapoxylin, kills drug-resistant cancer cell lines, having nothing to do with these two proteins against which it was developed. So there's some new mechanism uh, that was lurking in this drug that we uncovered through this PRISM profiling method. And we're working on uh, how to turn this drug for doggies into a future drug for patients with drug-resistant cancers. More to follow on that. So the last um, vignette that I, that I want to share is the following, which is that even if we develop great drugs for cancer, but they only result in an initial patient response, but then the, the cancer just comes back, that's not good. That's not really getting where we need to be. We want a drug or combination of drugs that will give a durable response um, and a long-term clinical benefit, if not cure. And so what are the sources of drug resistance that allow cancers to come back? Well, one of them is this multi-drug resistance thing I talked about before, but the other thing that, that researchers are increasingly understanding is that actually it may not just be the cancer cell itself that is becoming drug resistant, but it's the so-called tumor microenvironment. It's all the normal cells that are surrounding the tumor cells, that those normal cells in the environment of the tumor can also be collaborating with the tumor to make it drug resistant, which is bad for patients. And all of this tumor microenvironment, the normal cells that are admixed with the tumor cells in patients, we don't look at any of that when we grow the cell lines in a Petri dish, because there it's just 100% cancer cells. And so those kind of simplified experiments in the laboratory are really attractive because you can do these massive large-scale studies that I told you about. But can we bring that kind of high throughput biology of the future? Can we bring that to bear on more complex in vivo, for example, animal studies? And so that's the work of Shin Jin, Dr. Dr. Ling in the lab, um, who um, led this effort to study metastasis and the ability of human cancer cells to grow in different organs in the body. And he said, well, we just made all these barcoded, hundreds of barcoded cell lines that I just told you about for the PRISM experiment. What would happen if we made a pool of, let's say, 500 barcoded cell lines? And what if we could inject those directly into a mouse, into the heart of a mouse, so that they then, those tumor cells, then circulate into the, throughout the body? And then count the barcodes in different organs 
in the mouse so that we could determine which tumor cells were able to survive, for example, in the brain or the lung or the liver or the kidney or in bone, and thereby develop a first ever new kind of map of metastasis that allows us to know for 500 cancer cell lines, where do each of them, what is the tumor microenvironment that is conducive to different kinds of cancer surviving in a living animal. And so I'm just showing a subset of the, the metastasis map or met map here, showing that there are some, these are, happen to all be breast cancers as shown here on the left. Some of these breast cancers are able to metastasize to all of the organs in the mouse. Some of them as shown here, HCC70, only metastasize to the liver, as we see in some patients. Some patients only have metastasis to one organ, but not others. And then some of them, for example, this one, Cal 851, doesn't metastasize at all. And because we have the complete molecular characterization of all of these 500 cell lines, we can now go back and ask, okay, what is it, for example, about those breast cancers that are able to selectively metastasize to the brain, for example, compared to those that cannot. And could we then learn what is it about brain metastatic breast cancers that distinguish themselves from those that are unable to metastasize to the brain? Um, and the results is just summarized on this, on this slide, which again, we have this enormous amount of genomic information. What mutations are there? Are there extra copies of certain genes in the tumor cell lines? What about the metabolites and RNAs and proteins and all this stuff? And we can ask, is there a consistent picture of what it is about a breast cancer that allows it to metastasize to the brain that we could learn from these data? And I'm not gonna go through this in any detail, except to say that a very consistent picture immediately emerged. And it was a big surprise. And that is that it's one of altered lipid metabolism or fat metabolism. There's something different about how these cancer cells that are able to, to grow in the brain metabolize fat compared to those that cannot metastasize to brain. And the short version here is that it, it looks like those cancer cells that are able to survive in the brain are able to generate their own lipids, their own fat, whereas those that cannot grow in the brain have to borrow fat from surrounding cells and surrounding tissues. And so we're working out how could we use this to exploit this kind of new molecular insight to develop uh, new therapies to prevent or treat breast cancer metastasis to the brain, because this is one of the leading causes of death in patients that suffer from breast cancer. So um, to conclude, um, let and then I'm happy to, to open it up for questions if there are any. I'm really excited about this direct-to-patient new way of connecting uh, with patients as partners in research that we call Count Me In, leveraging social media and internet-based informed consent to identify and enroll patients throughout the country and hopefully throughout the world so they can all participate as partners in cancer research. I've also tried to, to uh, share with you that even though it's been 20 years since we've had the first sequence of the human genome, there's still an enormous amount that we don't know. And I showed some examples of hundreds or possibly thousands of proteins, gene, protein encoding genes still hidden in the human genome remaining to be discovered. And some of those are going to be great targets for cancer. I showed you one of these molecular barcoding methods that we're using to try to deal with the fact that we now know that cancer is not a single disease, but it's hundreds of diseases that are all molecularly distinct. And so our research methods need to incorporate 
that kind of molecular diversity into our research to find better drugs for the future. And then last, I showed you that these new kinds of maps, you know, we initially had maps of the human genome, and we have maps of variation in human genome sequence around populations. This is just a different type of map, a map of metastatic potential, where we can now find correlates of molecular changes in tumors that will predictably lead to metastatic potential. And if we can make cancer less of a mystery and make it more predictable, how will a given tumor respond in terms of its spread in the body? Or how will a given tumor respond to a drug? Then we can really get serious about tailoring the right treatment to the right patient. And that's what cancer precision medicine is all about. So um, I want to give credit to the people that have done this work. I won't read their names again, uh, but of course, this is a, a team-based uh, effort, uh, and so I'm grateful for all of their work and grateful uh, for your attention today, and I'm very happy to take questions if there are any. I'll Thank you for sharing my screen. Yeah, this is wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing all of this. Um, I would like to follow up with a few questions from the audiences and myself. Uh, the first question actually came from myself. So, you know, in the past couple of years, um, the emergence of tools, for example, like single cell RNA-seq, like uh, DNA sequencing, optogenetics, uh, CRISPR tools have, re have really revolutionized the field. Um, I wonder what is the next frontier you predict that can help us better understand um, uh, biology in general, or promote our understanding and application of precision medicine? Well, I, I think there's still a long way to go using even those tools that you mentioned. You know, in particular, genome editing keeps getting better and better. The first generation of genome edi editing with CRISPR allowed researchers to knock out genes and eliminate their function entirely. But now there are new methods that make it possible to correct single base spelling mistakes to not just eliminate the gene entirely, but to change it subtly, for example, from a mutant form to a normal form. And I think that's gonna be extraordinary. There are certain challenges to that from a treatment perspective, for example, delivering those kinds of precision genome editing tools is still a challenge. It works quite well in the liver, for example. There was a paper in Nature last week showing that essentially with 100% efficiency, you could edit the with single base resolution, the edit the cells within a liver in a non-human primate uh, and also in, in, in mice. But outside the liver, that remains a challenge. So I think figuring out how to make that work really well is going to be important. Single cell sequencing you mentioned. So this is the ability to look at the gene expression profile, not of a tissue all ground up and averaged across the tens or maybe hundreds of cell types within a given tissue, but to look at each individual cell one at a time. That's really powerful, but probably not going to be practical for use in the clinic. So one technology that I'm really excited about is so-called spatial transcriptomics. And this is a method that allows you to look at the gene expression program of individual cells. So it's single cell resolution, but without disturbing the tissue at all. And that's important because you can look at the gene expression pattern of cells with respect to their geographic adjacency to each other, and because it doesn't require isolating the individual cells as the first step. And that first step technically is gonna be really difficult in a clinical setting. And so if you could bring the power of single cell genomics to bear on just a routine tissue section, like of a biopsy that is routine collect, routinely collected in a hospital, that's going to be really powerful. That's not quite possible yet, but it's it's getting there. 
Yeah, definitely. Spatial transcriptomes is super exciting. I still see papers coming out from different groups around the world. Um, I would like to follow up with a question that is actually built upon the previous question. So the question is from our audience, um, Yu Bing, and he was asking how far away we are from precision medicine in psychiatric diseases or neurodegenerative disorders and how to pr apply precision, uh, precise genetic tools to diseases of complex genetic uh, predisposition such as autism and schizophrenia. And that's, that's a great question. So maybe let, let's take schizophrenia as an example. That is a huge worldwide challenge for patients and their families. And there have been essentially no diagnostic tests for it ever. No molecular basis of it known. Um, and no, or maybe one new drug in the last 50 years. So it's been really tough, really frustrating, and very little progress. And so for that reason, um, companies, for example, have just said, look, we don't even know what to work on because we don't know the biology of the disease. We don't know what genes um, uh, cause it. Um, and so what are we supposed to work on? And so they said, we're going to work on other diseases where we can get more traction. So it's been very slow progress. An international consortium of, of researchers actually led by the Broad Institute now a number of years ago said, all right, the path to make progress for schizophrenia is going to be to do very large scale genetic studies to ask, are there genes that predispose to risk for, for disease? Even if the relative risk of those genetic signals is modest, it's a clue as to the biology. So that is to say the goal of those kinds of genetic studies is not to say, okay, you're going to get schizophrenia and you're not. That's too determinative and the genetics aren't that powerful. But it's a really powerful way to say, oh, here are the pathways that are involved in schizophrenia and that's going to be the path to targeted drugs. And so it's interesting, actually, the first genetic studies were of modest size and they didn't show anything. They didn't show any evidence of genetic predisposition. And so the naysayers of, of human genetics said, see, I told you so, genetics isn't as powerful as everyone says, the human genome isn't that useful after all. And, but the people who believed said, no, this is just a statistical power problem. We need larger studies. And so they went back and they made the studies even larger, you know, 100,000 patients kind of scale. And there you saw an overwhelmingly strong signal. And in a paper that will come out, I think next month in Nature, uh, a whole new set of genes with rare coding mutations um, that are predisposing to schizophrenia. Those mutations are really rare. So as a diagnostic test, it's not gonna be that useful because almost nobody has those mutations. The minority of patients with schizophrenia have those mutations, but as a hint as to the biology, a rare example of a common pathway that is likely to underlie common forms of schizophrenia, it's enormously helpful. So now all of a sudden there are biological pathways that are being implicated in schizophrenia and that is providing the starting point for drug discovery. So I think we're gonna see a whole new set of biology and drug discovery happening for these neuropsychiatric uh, diseases that are only for the first time possible. And I think that's really exciting. Yeah, this is truly exciting. Um, the next question is from Jay. Um, and he was wondering, do we now have a clear picture of the cancer cells differentiation? Yeah, so differentiation um, uh, therapy is a really interesting idea. So part of the you know normal cells when they develop and mature, they so it's referred to as differentiation, this normal cellular maturation process. And in many, probably all cancers, 
the tumor cells get arrested in an immature, poorly differentiated state. Um, there's one spectacular example of, in a particular type of leukemia, actually the, the observation first made in China, um, that treatment with these leukemia cells with all transretinoic acid can induce the differentiation, the maturation of these leukemia cells into benign, mature cells that don't harm the patient. That it's it's still one of the most stunning uh, discoveries in all of oncology. And so this particular type of leukemia went from almost overnight from one of the most deadly forms of leukemia to the most treatable forms of leukemia. And it's happening by way of coaxing the leukemia cells to complete their normal differentiation, their normal maturation process. So it's attractive to think that, well, if all cancer cells, colon cancer cells, lung cancer cells, whatever, are also stuck in their differentiation, poorly differentiated state, would it be possible to also induce those to differentiate with other triggers? There's been interest, and we've actually worked on this a bit too, and it's been harder to find, but I still think it's a really exciting concept, so-called differentiation therapy that doesn't aim to kill the cells, but aims to induce them to mature and then die a natural death as normal cells do, have a normal life cycle. That's really attractive in principle, but it's been tougher in practice to get it to work. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is uh, about pediatric in the pediatric field. So the question is, um, for example, sitting without support normally happens um, as the newborn is four to nine months old. If moms start practicing fitting head as early as the newborn in five days old, will the whole gross motor development happen earlier? For example, sitting without support happened before four months old? Um, it's, it's an interesting question, and I'll admit I'm not particularly equipped to, to answer it, but it's, it's certainly clear that um, this, the tools of, of genomics and molecular medicine can and should be brought to bear on these questions in development, um, which has largely been an observational sort of field. Um, but I think some of these same tools um, could be brought to bear on, on normal human development to, to have a scientific uh, answer to questions like that. I, I don't know the answer. It's an interesting question. Thanks. Uh, the next question is quite interesting. The next, the, next, the next question is, the earliest tumor is found in Asian human ancestors' foot around 1.7 million years ago. Can the next generations of DNA sequencing find Asian human tumor information? Yeah, so that, that's there has been, you know, extensive interest in sequencing uh, ancient DNA um, to study ancestry. Uh, I'm not aware of efforts to um, sequence the 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 um, genomes of tumors um, from ancient DNA. Uh, it's a really interesting question, though, I mean, and it would. So let's speculate, what might you see there? Will it look fundamentally the same uh, as uh, modern tumors from, from a tumor genome perspective, or will it look radically different? Um, I don't know. I think it, it's clear that a lot of the molecular fingerprint of modern cancers relates to the environment, diet, smoking, um, other types of exposures. And so to the extent that those exposures obviously would have been quite different um, in ancient times, I would expect that the pattern of mutation um, would be different. However, I would bet that the fundamental pathways that are at play in making, let's say, a breast cancer are probably the same. 
thousands of years ago as, as they are today, but the path to get there uh, might have been different. Um, awesome, thank you so much. Um, I would like to ask the last question on behalf of the audience. Um, I know that during our research, there are a lot of uh, potential targets, pathway showing up as potential uh, druggable targets. Um, and in animal models, a lot of drugs or chemicals seems to work, but when we want to translate it in humans or um, in clinical settings, we always have this big hurdle. What do you think is the um, fundamental explanation for that? And what do you think can, um, what kind of tools can be used to address this question, uh, this issue? Yeah, that's, that's a really important question. It's, so it's true that there are many cancer drugs that look promising in mice, for example, and then in humans look really disappointing, maybe don't work at all. So what are possible answers for that? One is, well, Mouse models are horrible. You should never use mouse models, okay? I don't think that's the right answer. I think more often than not, what explains that discrepancy is that researchers focus their studies in mice on a particular- The title is Steps to a Slide. I have- Let's say, you know, colon cancer type two subclass one. I just made that up, okay? Um, um, and and then do many, many experiments, for example, in a particular or maybe two or maybe three at most models of colon cancer and then declare we have a colon cancer drug, okay? And then that drug is brought to any patient with colon cancer where we know that there's enormous molecular heterogeneity of even just within colon cancer. And, and then the drug doesn't work. So I think what best explains that discrepancy is the failure to embrace this molecular diversity of, can of human cancer in the preclinical mouse studies. And that if we did a better job there, the mouse studies would be more predictive. And that's why I focused on like this prism idea of looking not at one or two or three cancer models, but hundreds at a time, both in the Petri dish and in mouse studies. If we can do that, then I predict our, the, the translational success rate will go up significantly. Awesome. This is so wonderful and exciting. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I would also like to thank our audiences for attending our conference from all around the world. Please stay tuned for our next session and hope to see you again. And thank you again, Professor Todd Gallup. Thank you. Bye.